from Jeff. Um, from someplace. From someplace. From someplace. <laughs> he's been a, a huge supporter of ours, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing this talk. Great. Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're going to talk today a little bit about mechanical CPR as a bridge to cath lab, um, but also as a bridge to extracorporeal circulation for the refractory arrest. Um, these are my disclosures. Oh, it fixed itself. Um, just some funding from Stryker and Bard. Have an NIH grant looking at uh, geospatial relationships in cardiac arrest. So we're trying to look at where arrests occur and then what the resources of the hospitals that are nearby and whether there's a disconnect and whether that suggests that there's a need for cardiac arrest centers like level one trauma centers. Do some, a lot of simulation training. We just did a simulation in, in Japan at Japanese Circulation Society last week um, with uh, ECMO and then uh, in part of this kind of cool group that's um, putting together a lot of data from U.S. centers that's doing ECMO in, in the emergency department for arrest. So to do this in the ED, um, you need a, a room that you can actually take care of these patients in. Um, one of the sort of paradoxes of medical resuscitation is many major centers in America, level one trauma centers, have dedicated trauma space but don't have dedicated medical resuscitation space. So the stuff that starts in the pre-hospital setting doesn't necessarily continue in that systematic fashion when it uh, gets to the emergency department. This is a ECMO receiving hospital in Osaka, Japan. So if you Google the EMS protocols for Osaka, you'll see that witness ventricular fibrillation arrest if it uh, doesn't get return of spontaneous circulation with three shocks. It has to be transported to one of the ECMO capable hospitals um, in the city. This one is not cat capable too. The other hospital, um, they can just cat right in the room as well. Um, but here they would go down the hall to cat the person. But otherwise, they can do everything here. And what they would do if you brought them a refractory VF patient is while they continued conventional CPR, they would also start cannulating for ECMO, and if they got ROS before the patient was cannulated, then they wouldn't proceed with the ECMO. So I'm going to talk just about the case context and then mechanical CPR, a little bit about ECMO and some of the U.S. and international experience. Um, so here's a typical patient. She's 37. <coughs> this is a Philadelphia case back in 2009. She smokes and she calls EMS because she's short of breath, so you know you know she's alive at that point in time. They get there and they see her, she's behind the door, it's a wood door on the bottom, glass on the top, and she's signaling that she can't breathe. She collapses and they come out and it takes them two minutes to break the window, push her body with the door, and then check for a pulse, that's their estimate. And they start chest compressions, put an AED on, she's in VF. Um, she gets defibrillated, ongoing VF, continued ACLS, and she gets intubated. Uh, three shocks, three doses of epi, some amiodarone, and it's a short transport time to Penn. They're about a mile and a half from the ED at Penn, and they bring her in. She uh, gets to the ED, and this is what happens to her. Ongoing ACLS, uh, 44 minutes after arrival, so 59 minutes of CPR at that point in time. She's been shocked 12 times, gotten 10 doses of epi, um, some vasopressin and some amiodarone, and this is what you see on the monitor. She's still in course VF, uh, and her end title CO2 is 32, which is probably what mine is right now, right? <laughs> so this is someone who's healthy in a lot of ways, even though she's dead, and it's someone who's been in the rest for 60 minutes, and we're not getting her out of that. So this is your classic refractory VF patient. So the paradox of CPR is that the longer you do it, the more survivors you get, but the longer you do it, the more neurologic survival goes down and the chances of getting return of spontaneous circulation goes down. Um, a lot of that was shown in this Goldberger paper from NRCPR. It's an interesting paper where they divided hospitals into the quartiles of the length of time they did CPR for in-hospital arrest, and they showed that the highest quartile of CPR time correlated with uh, the highest percentage of neurologically intact outcomes. So it's probably a marker for better quality CPR for a willingness to invest in the patients and then also better quality post-arrest care as well. But as the arrest goes on, you get this vicious cycle of ischemia, low cardiac output, refractory VF, very hard to defibrillate the person out of that. This is looking at it in a different way. This is a paper that um, 
some Japanese colleagues and I published in circulation last year, but it's looking at out-of-hospital arrests in Japan, and the, the gray is uh, cases with neurologic, favorable neurologic outcome that had pre-hospital return of spontaneous circulation. The black is return of spontaneous circulation after ED arrival and with good neurologic outcome. And then we looked at just different rhythms um, in what length of time it took to get 99% of the survivors, and it's 40 to 50 minutes of CPR before you get 90%, 99% of the survivors when you consider all rhythms. But you can see there's a big drop off somewhere around 20 minutes. So the question is, how can we move this to earlier on in the arrest where you'll get most of your return of spontaneous circulation, good survivors, with conventional CPR, and then we can use other strategies to change the trajectory of the cur curve at this point in time. And that's where we'll start to think about mechanical CPR. So what are the options for this woman? She's 59 minutes of arrest. She's still in course VF. She has a good end tidal CO2. We could continue conventional CPR. So Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again <laughs> when it doesn't work. So maybe it's insane to continue conventional CPR. We could put her on a Lucas device and send her to the cath lab. In fact, in this case, we'd never done that at Penn, but we called the cath lab and um, made their day. They thought that was very funny. Um, so we did not get her to the cath lab on a Lucas device at that point. But there's case reports, and I'll show you some of the, the data about using mechanical CPR for that. We could put her on ECMO at that point. We hadn't started our ED ECMO program at Penn at that point in time, so that was not something that we did regularly, and we did call CT surgery in this case, and they said, you know, you should have called sooner. So um, we didn't get her on that mount. Um, this is Dr. Sakamoto. One of the biggest studies that's been done is called the Save J study. It's a prospective um, sort of observational study. It's not a randomized study. They look at centers in Japan that do ED ECMO and centers that don't, and they compare outcomes, but they sort of statistically significant improvement in um, neurologically intact outcomes if you put refractory VF on to ESMO. Or we could terminate resuscitation attempts. So that's a euphemism calling the code um, for the time of death was, right? So that's what you can do in these cases. You don't have that many options left to treat the person. So what we did in this case was, uh, at this point in time, we got a trauma code into the trauma bay on the attending for the trauma bay and for this room. And you just have to say, you know, I can't dedicate any more resources to this patient. So we called her code at uh, 63 minutes. She was still in VF. She had an end tidal CO2 of 35 when we pronounced her dead. So is she dead at that point in time? You know, what is dead in this person? Are her cells dead? Is she dead? Are her mitochondria dead? What's salvageable in that person? And it's sort of a philosophical question, but. Um, my boss at Penn, Lance Becker, who's a big cardiac arrest researcher, he's up on, uh, at Long Island Jewish now as the chair up there. This is one of his um, sort of provocative slides. And the question is, when we call someone dead, are their cells dead? Um, and what he would say is we pronounce people dead before their cells are dead. And this is from work he's done with isolated myocardiocytes. So if you take heart muscle and put it onto a slide and then expose it to ischemia, no blood flow, and then reperfusion. The cells aren't dead when they're ischemic. They don't die for two hours after that. So when we would pronounce a person dead, all these cells are salvageable. We just don't have a way to deliver oxygen and then correct the underlying problem. So that's what we're thinking about with mechanical CPR and uh, ECMO. So let's just talk a little bit about mechanical CPR. There's really two devices, Lucas and Autopulse, that are available to us. Um, that's the Lucas device. Um, it's not turned on, but um, we were just playing around with it in the trauma bay one day. Um, I just was in Singapore uh, teaching a course on hypothermia for the Ministry of Health, and every ambulance in Singapore has a Lucas device on the ambulance, and they have a specific protocol where they transition from regular CPR to mechanical CPR at a certain point in their arrest and then go to transport. They're in a, in a uh, nationwide system where they can't do termination of resuscitation in the pre-hospital setting. So all of their 22 to 2300 cardiac arrests a year are transported to emergency departments. 
And so they need to use a device like, like this to transport them safely. So we can use this as a bridge to the cath lab, um, PCI, or to ECMO. Um, and as I said, the two devices that you could use are autopulse or Lucas. And one of the important things with the mechanical devices is to really separate the trials that have compared it to conventional CPR from other uses of these devices, right? So when you compare, compare it to conventional CPR, it's always a question of what's the quality of the conventional CPR when you're starting the device. This is really talking about how can I extend CPR, how can I extend the length of time of CPR, and how do these devices help me with that? So this is one of the first case reports that came out. It's from Lars Wick and some other people over in Oslo, and they talked about two patients who were put on to mechanical CPR and went to the cath lab. One was a 53-year-old guy with Ms. VF, Lucas to the cath lab, um, got an LAD stent, and at 110 minutes, he had no return of spontaneous circulation, so they stopped. So they could have put him on ECMO. They could have gone Lucas, cath lab, stent, no ROSC, and then put them on ECMO, right? But they didn't choose to do that. The second one was another 53-year-old woman in this case. Uh, she got a two-vessel PCI, PCI and went into PEA, got put on a Lucas, then got a PCI of her LAD as well. So she's gotten three stents in the cath lab, which is high risk, but one of them was after she arrested, and then she had return of spontaneous circulation after they sent her LAD. She survived left the hospital neurologically intact. Um, and then in this study, it's worth reading, they um, did a uh, occlusion model of the LAD in five pigs, and then they put the Lucas device on, and they just used that as a way to study how to shoot their cath films so they could shoot the films while the Lucas device is running. And then, uh, this looks like a human to me, but they say it's a mannequin. Um, and this is them shooting some some images, and you see you have to shoot oblique images while you're running the Lucas so that you can see your vessels. So it's very um, basic stuff for an interventional cardiologist to, to just look at the vessels from a different perspective. Um, and so you can run the Lucas device while you're doing most of your catheterization. This is another case report. This is actually an Italian case report that came out recently where there's a, I guess all these people get put on if they're 53 years old, right? This is nice <laughs> um, Thankfully, I'm just older than that, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, so, uh, witnessed arrest while walking, known coronary artery disease, uh, was with his wife. She didn't know how to do CPR, but got dispatcher instructions for CPR. Um, and then the first responder got there, 10 minutes um, CPR in progress, in sort of classic case, NVF defibrillated, intubated, um, uh, got a right EJ IV in the pre-hospital setting, some saline, two additional shots, epi and the odorone. So very similar to the patient I was telling you about. And still in VF. So the helicopter medical team got there, they put the Lucas on, so now they're switching from conventional That's CPR to mechanical CPR for transport. And at 40 minutes, um, the VF went into PEA. Took him by a helicopter. This is one of the 10 star helicopters from when I was a medical command physician for 10 star for five years. But the quest, the idea is to get him to the right place at the right time. So they transported to the cath lab. They packed the guy in ice um, bags for transport. And then in the cath lab, got a PCI and a stent in the LAD and a stent in the CERC. And you can see the blood gas. Um, at um, arrival in the cath lab, big base deficit, huge lactate, and then return of spontaneous circulation occurred after the PCI. So that makes sense, right? You have ischemic myocardium, you open up the vessel, you reperfuse it, you get oxygen delivery, and then you have uh, muscle that's um, amenable to defibrillation. And um, 90 minutes on the Lucas to 115 minutes after cardiac arrest. Hypothermia activated on day five and a full recovery after rehab. So that's your classic patient that you can actually bridge with a mechanical device to the cath lab. The, one of the big debates is should this guy have gotten on ECMO and then go to the cath lab or do you go to the cath lab and then put him on ECMO if he doesn't get return of spontaneous circulation after you open up the vessel. No one really knows the answer to that because we're still just accruing cases and it needs to be studied more fully. But this is the outcome you're looking for in these patients. 
Here's um, a case series of patients who are already in the cath lab getting procedures and then they arrest in the cath lab and it's over a four year period. And these are patients who arrest in the lab and then they're not responsive to the fibrillation and a few minutes of manual CPR. So they get the Lucas applied and then they're looking for whether they get return of spontaneous circulation and what their CPC, their cerebral performance um, category score. So a one or a two is considered neurologically intact or at least a good neurologic outcome. A two can uh, have some minor deficits. Um, and they talk about 32 patients. This is why they're not amenable to defibrillation because they're almost all in a non-shockable rhythm when they arrest. So in the lab, getting a procedure, arrest, and it's a non-shockable rhythm. 17 died in the lab, but 15 had return of spontaneous circulation, went from the lab to an ICU, and eight discharged from the hospital neurologically intact. So that's not bad. Eight out of 32, 25% neurologically intact survival for a group of patients that aren't responding to conventional CPR in the cath lab. Um, let's see if this will work. This is not the greatest video. This is from, from uh, Physio Control, but it just shows you a little bit about how you'll use the, a device like the Lucas for um, catheterization. It's only a couple minutes. So this is someone who's in the lab and is getting PCI and then arrests. Um, and so they're using the Lucas device and the person has a circuit collusion. And so they are shooting their films and this is gonna be an oblique angle and they're able to run the Lucas device shoot their films and then they're turning it on and off while they're getting some other images and uh, then they'll turn it back on again and then off and this is a little bit more on and off than I've seen when when um, I've seen people do this in general you're just shooting your films and you're continuing to run the Lucas device but then they're putting their deploying their stent and then they're going to inflate the stent and they're basically giving as much CPR as they feel is possible during this time while they're opening up the vessel and reperfusing the patient. Um, and this is always an issue when we're putting someone on ECMO is how much time does someone feel like they need to shut off the, the um, Lucas device to cannulate and stuff like that. The people that are very fast about this will just cannulate while the device is running. So um, the other use of a mechanical device is to bridge to uh, extracorporeal CPR. So the goal of this is to cannulate quickly, cannulate safely, get as many people onto a mechanical device that can give you a prolonged period of CPR um, or support until you can figure out why the person arrested and reverse the cause of arrest. In most cases, it's a cardiac cause of arrest and what they need is a, a cardiac catheterization. And this is slowly moving into being an ED procedure. My prediction is that 15 years from now, this will be considered standard of care for emergency physicians. And a lot of people say that's crazy, but we used to not be able to intubate. We used to not be able to do ultrasound. Sedation. And this is really a natural progression from central venous catheter placement, A-line placement, to placement of, of larger cannulas um, to, to provide someone with cardiopulmonary support. So the goal here, and this is basically looking at that curve I showed you from the now paper that's been reversed. When people arrest, they're obviously alive, and then there's a big drop off in survival during CPR, and then there's another drop-off during post-arrest care, right? And so we'll figure out a lot of ways to treat this with hypothermia, other aspects of a whole bundle of post-arrest care, hemodynamic management, neuroprognostication, and early trip to the cath lab. But the real question is when do you pull people out of this downward curve and give them other therapies, which would be mechanical CPR, early eCPR, controlled reperfusion, and then post arrest care, and there's lots of interesting experimental stuff about controlled reperfusion. For example, if you take a pig and you put it into cardiac arrest and then you reperfuse it with um, a cocktail that includes a little bit of cyanide, they do very well. Um, and the reason for that is cyanide is produced by us, all of us, at a very low level in our body, and it, 
it's a mitochondrial modulator. So it, it, it modulates the switch that shuts mitochondria on and off. So there's all this interesting stuff about using that, things like hydrogen sulfide, things that are very toxic, but if you use them in a controlled reperfusion fashion, you can get much better outcomes in an animal model. Not ready for prime time in humans yet. Um, but this is the goal for us, is to get more survivors. And if we do this, we may be able to get survival of greater than 50%, at least for things like refractory witness VF. Um, so looking at this patient we were talking about, why should we candidate for ECPR? It's fairly obvious. She's in good health before she arrests. Um, it's a witness to arrest. They see her arrest when they're walking off. She gets immediate CPR, it's a shockable rhythm, high quality CPR, short transport time, and then she has ongoing gas exchange in the ED. So this is the perfect person to pull the trigger early, someplace around 20 minutes of total arrest time, and then start to get this person on to pump. And the goal is to take the blood out of the venous side, put it to a pump and an oxygenator, and then put it back in the arterial side, um, and that way you can bridge the person um, to the PCI and other interventions. So you're bridging it until the native cardiac outputs are stored. It allows some time to gauge the cause of arrest. And in expert hands, this can be done quickly. I've been in the cath lab in Japan and seen someone go into arrest and eight minutes later, they're on functional epidemiology. So very quick. It's easier, too, you know, on 65 kilo people than 165 kilo people. Um, but so we have some challenges here in America that they don't have over there. So recent US experience with this, um, this is from Sharp Memorial Hospital in San Diego. And Zach Shiner and Joe Belazzo are emergency physicians. They didn't train in critical care, but they have a lot of interest in resuscitation and cardiac arrest. And what they did was they partnered with their CT surgeons. They do monthly um, refreshers on ECMO cannulation. But when they first did this, the emergency physicians would put in the femoral arterial and venous lines, and then the CT surgeons would come down upscale to ECMO cannula and then start the ECMO. Since then, they moved on to this all being done by the emergency physicians, and then there's a call to the cath lab that we put a refractory VF patient on ECMO and they're coming up to the lab. And that's when the CT surgeons hear about them. So they reported in resuscitation on the first 18 patients, 10 didn't get cannulated, eight got cannulated, and five discharged from the hospital neurologic intact. So it's suggestive that this is a good um, way to bridge these patients. This is our program at Penn um, when I was there where we partnered with CT surgery and we put 26 patients on ECMO in the ED. This was a difficult thing because you're having the CT surgeons come down, you're not doing it yourself. And they'll come down and then they'll say, you know, I don't think this is a good candidate and they're making the final decision. So what happened was even though the program was mostly for refractory VF, we end up with only 43% VF because we put a lot of the young people on ECMO that were drug overdoses, um, asystole, and none of them did well. But we had four survivors to discharge and 75% of them were CPC one or two, so three out of the four. So fairly low survival, um, but shows you that you can do it with the CT surgeons. This is way too long a period of time. This should be down in the 50 minute range. And that's one of the reasons that we don't have uh, as many survivors as we should have had out of this protocol. We had the protocol and we had a flow <laughs> diagram to try and control the chaos of what goes on when you bring all these services down and, and put someone on ECMO. More recently, um, these are the really the two uh, sort of state-of-the-art trials. This is from Stephen Bernard's group over at the Alfred Hospital in, in Melbourne, and he was one of the guys who did one of the landmark studies on hypothermia after cardiac arrest that was in the journal in 2002. But this is their program where they put patients in the pre-hospital setting or refractory in-hospital VF on mechanical CPR, sorry, hypothermia intra-arrest while they're getting the person on CPR. You get them on ECMO and then early reperfusion in the cath lab. And you can see much quicker time from collapse to ECMO, 56 minutes, than we had. 
keep them on there for a couple of days while you wean them down while the heart recovers. And this is the survivor they were able to get, 14 out of 26 patients neurologically intact, so 56% survival. So getting above that sort of magical 50% survival for these patients. Um, Pre-hospital ECMO, this is really cool. Um, Lionel Lamhut's a uh, critical care doctor over in Paris. And in Paris, the, the SAMU system over there, they have um, physicians that are on the ambulance. And so what they started doing was taking ECMO to the pre-hospital setting and for refractory VF cannulating the patients in the pre-hospital setting. This was their first report where they talked about seven patients cannulated in the pre-hospital setting. It took them 22 minutes to, from starting cannulation to get on ECMO, but collapsed the functional ECMO under that hour that people think is maybe um, an important barrier to, to um, recovery. And one of those seven people survived neurologically intact. And then since then, uh, this is about a year and a half ago, they reported, again, about seven out of 18 patients discharged, so getting up towards the 50% range. Why is the Mona Lisa here? Because oh, one of the go. patients they put on in a, in a uh, gallery at the Louvre. So <laughs> this is them cannulating in front of priceless art with the security <laughs> guards from the Louvre. Um, this person did not survive uh, to hospital discharge, but went to the cath lab and got a stent. <laughs> Um, and then died in neurological chest down the road. This is the most recent US study. Um, this is from Dimitri Yiannopoulos, who's an interventional cardiologist at Minnesota. And they've developed a protocol that's very similar to the Osaka protocol. So they have now in the city of Minneapolis a protocol for refractory VF. If there's three shocks and they don't have return of spontaneous circulation, they transport them to the University of Minnesota, and they go during the day straight to the cath lab. So refractory VF, no loss, put them on the Lucas and go straight to the cath lab, where they get put on ECMO and then get angiography and PCI as needed. At night, they stop in the ED for continued conventional CPR until the cath team arrives. The next iteration will be stopping the ED at night. The ED physicians put them on ECMO and they go to the cath lab so they're not wasting time. Um, 27 transported, 18 red inclusion criteria. They got almost all of them on ECMO. All of them got angiography, and you can see two thirds of them needed an acute intervention, and 55% survived the discharge, and only one of them not neurologically intact. And these are all brought from the pre-hospital setting in refractory DF. So this is very promising. Um, that this is a, a resuscitation strategy where if you can orchestrate all the steps of this, you can get very good outcomes for these patients. So to wrap up, um, the physiologic rationale for using mechanical CPR and, uh, as a bridge to the cat lab and to, to extracorporeal CPR I think is, is, is very sound. You need high quality CPR for salvage, so that suggests that you need a mechanical device to transport. <coughs> and whether you do PCI then ECMO or ECMO then PCI is unclear. It's probably going to be related to the total length of time someone's been in arrest. So if they can hit the ED or the cath lab 20 minutes after the arrest starts, you probably just open the vessel up and see what happens. If you're at 40 minutes, you're going to put them on ECMO and go forward from there. And then there's going to be a whole optimal bundle of post-cardiac arrest care. Um, Pre-hospital ECMO is feasible. This is done uh, in Vienna as well. It's done in several other places in Europe. And this will be the move, at least at some centers, is to move to the pre-hospital setting and cannulate and then bring them in. You need to do simulation to learn how to do this, learn the skill set associated with it. This is an example of pre-hospital ECMO. This is Regensburg, Germany. Um, they have these Hertz Lungen machines, they're little Audi um, sport wagons, and in the back is all the ECMO equipment you need. And they have a protocol there to refractory VF, um, not responding to conventional CPR. These cars go to all witness VF arrests, and then if they're at the scene and there hasn't been rost at 15 minutes, They'll cannulate them in the restaurant or in the living room of the home, and they won't transport them until they're on running ECMO, getting cooled, and then they transport them to the cat <coughs> lab and uh, go forward from there. And that's their pre-hospital protocol in several cities in Germany.
are. Oh, that's it. So thanks. Any questions, guys? Questions? Uh,